welcome back to Intro to Tech Skills here at Microsoft Build. Maybe you missed us because we were gone for about a whole day. And just, just to remind you, if you do want to have more activities outside of the breaks, don't forget to check out Artificial Intelligence Gaming, the Microsoft Time Machine game, and also Cloud Skills Challenge, because there are amazing opportunities to win swag and some extra goodies from there. So just before we get started, how about we just talk a bit more about the map? So we're here back on day two, our first session of the day, and we're going to be going into more of a launching into the industry look today. So what's our first session today, Gwen? Yeah, today we're diving a little deeper into some technical skills and some career-focused skills as well. Speaking about AI gaming, like we were just talking about, our next session is a guided journey into AI with Microsoft Cloud Advocates, Dimitri and Carlota. Uh, Carlota is known as the R Queen and is focused on all the R uh, development content here at Microsoft. And Dimitri is focused on neural networks and deep learning. They're going to tell you what those things actually mean during the session. Well, that sounds so amazing, Gwen, and I'm really excited to hear from both Dimitri and Carlota. So off to them. Hi, Dimitri and Carlota. Hello. Hi, guys. Thanks for this great introduction. And hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on wherever you are in the world. And thanks for joining us for this session, or better we could say for this journey. So Dimitri and I will be your guide in this journey for the next 45 minutes, and I really hope you'll enjoy the trip. So let me uh, introduce, uh, let me start by introducing Dimitri. Um, Dimitri, um, uh, besides um, uh, being a cloud advocate at Microsoft, he's also um, uh, teaches at university, AI, machine learning, and deep learning technologies. Um, so uh, he also develops content used by many student developers and beginner learners. So I'm thrilled to have him here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlotta. Well, uh, uh, let me tell you something about Carlotta. Before become, becoming Cloud Advocate, Carlotta worked as a consultant at Microsoft, helping big companies in Europe uh, to use AI and the cloud effectively. And she also lives in Rome. And Rome is the city that has best ice cream in the world, according to some tourist guide. Yeah, yeah, true, totally true. So we have been talking for just a few minutes and you might have noticed that we already used quite a few terms belonging to the area of artificial intelligence. We mentioned machine learning, deep learning, data science. There's so much different technology in the artificial intelligence area and so much in learning material on the web that the learner can feel like an explorer like in an uncharted territory. So if you're feeling like this, it's totally fine, we feel you. And that's indeed from this feeling that came out the idea of this session, along with the belief that artificial intelligence is dramatically changing and impacting our lives and our society, and it will do it more in the future. So you cannot definitely be out of this change, and not to mention, of course, how much fascinating this subject is. Well, we only have 45 minutes for this session, so we cannot possibly cover everything. So what we will do, we will show you uh, some exciting demos, uh, we will give just a brief uh, introduction, and hopefully that will be enough to get you excited to learn more. That's our goal. And if you want to learn more, we have the content for you. Today, we are releasing AI for Beginners curriculum, which is open source curriculum available on GitHub under MIT license, which, is, uh, which can be used by both students and teachers. Teachers can uh, take that material and include it in their courses, and students uh, who I hope are watching us, you can uh, take the material, you can use it to learn, uh, play with the examples, um, and in no time you will be able to train complex uh, machine learning models. But uh, this journey will be just a start. Let's start our journey. Sure, so since we are starting a journey, first thing first, we need a map, right? Secondly, we need a destination. So our trip will count four stops across the globe, and for each stop, we'll be doing a short demo to put in practice some theoretical concept and showcase some of the capabilities of machine learning models and algorithms. So let's then start by crossing a random forest and stopping in Antarctica. But why Antarctica, you could ask? Because we are going to deal with the following task. Classify a group of penguins with corresponding species. Classification is one of the most common techniques of what we usually call classical machine learning, or better, we should say supervised machine learning. That means a technique able to learn a predictive function from a data set containing known labels, where a label is the category we want to predict, in this case, the penguin species, along with uh, predictive features, in this case, the physical characteristic of the penguins. 
This function can then be applied to unknown data to predict the labels given the features. So there are two types of, class of classification problem, binary classification and multi-class classification. A binary classification answers to a yes no type of question like, does this penguin belong to the adult family? While a multi-class classification answers to a more complex question where more than one answer or more than one category um, is possible as an answer. Like, to which family does this penguin belong to? There are a wide variety of classification algorithms and tree-based algorithms are among the most common ones and probably also the best ones to start with, since the way they work is very intuitive. In fact, the decision trees take a step-by-step -step approach to predict a variable, and this type of algorithm starts with all of the data at the root node, the root of the tree, and scans all of the variables for the best one to split on. Uh, while random forest belongs to a more complex category of algorithms called ensemble algorithms. They work by combining multiple base estimators to produce an optimal model. In the case of a random forest, it applies an averaging function to multiple decision tree models for a better overall model, um, able to be more efficient with larger data sets and more complex problems. Well, now let's make our hands a bit dirty and dig into some R code. R is one of the most popular programming languages for data scientists, thanks to its intuitive syntax and the extensive set of functionalities. So let's start with our first demo. So the first step of our adventure will be to build a multi-class classifier using three based algorithms in order to separate penguins into categories of species. For this demo, we'll be using an R notebook in a GitHub called Spaces Environment and the Palmer Penguins data, which contains size measurements for three penguin species that were observed in Antarctica. In R, the Palmer Penguins package provides the data that's related to these adorable creatures. So first thing first, let's load this package together with the other packages from the tidy models collection required throughout the demo. Then let's have a quick overview of the data we are going to use. This dataset contains different information around the penguins. We have the name of the species, uh, which is also the label we want to predict. We have three species, Adelie, Chinstrap and Gentoo. We have the name of the island, the bill length, the depth of the penguin bill, the length of the penguin flipper, the measure of the body mass, the sex and the, and the year of study. But for sake of simplicity, let's consider only the physical characteristics of the penguins as feature predictors. So let's select bill length, bill depth, flipper length and body mass, and body mass columns, along with the species column that we want to predict from our dataset. Before using this data to train our model, let's perform some preprocessing in order to discard rows that contain no feature values at all, so not available values, since they won't be useful in training a model. Now that we have, built, we have dealt with the missing values, let's explore how the features relate to the label by creating some box charts. So let's zoom in the box plots. From, the, from these plots, we can observe that it, it looks like species Adelie and Chinstrap have similar data profiles for bill depth, body mass and flipper length, while Chinstrap tend to have longer bill length. On the contrary, Gentoo tends to have fairly clearly differentiated features from the others, which should help us train a good classification model. But before training the model, we need to split the dataset into two subsets, one for training uh, and one for validation. So we will put 70% of the dataset into the training dataset. Um, now let's start by training a decision tree model since we just talked about decision trees. So let's build a model specification for a decision tree and let's fit the model using the fit function. So by printing out the model, we can already see which decision have been taken at each step and in which order. But visualizing the tree using fancy R part can be more intuitive. So let's do that. Here we are. So, um, as we previously observed, the Gentoo penguins have clearly differentiated features from the others, and in particular, for free per length less than 207, we do not have any example of Adelie or Chinstrap species in the dataset. While to distinguish between Adelie and Chinstrap, 
we need to rely on the bill length feature since the two species have similar ranges of values for the other two features. Now, let's use the train decision tree model in order to predict the labels of the test data set and let's print out the first 10 results. In this way, we can have a first impression of how the model is performing, observing that in most cases the prediction is correct with a significant confidence score. Obviously, this is not the best way to evaluate the performances of a model. We'd rather rely, for example, on a confusion matrix, in particular heat map. The confusion matrix shows the intersection of predicted and actual label values for each class, and the darker squares indicate high number of cases. And hopefully, like in this case, you can see that they form a diagonal line that shows where the predicted and actual labels value are the same. In simpler terms, for example, these are 43 penguins that were labeled as Adelie species and were actually um, Adelie penguins. So the confusion matrix is helpful also because it gives rise to other metrics that can help you better evaluate the performance of a classification model. So let's go through some of them. The most common one, of course, is the accuracy, which is the proportion of labels that were predicted accurately, for example. But we also have the precision, which is the proportion of predictive positives that are actually positive, and the recall, which is the proportion of positive results out of the number of samples that were actually positive. These metrics are defined for binary classification problem, but for a multi-class classification problem like this one, they, become, they can be calculated for each class using a one versus stress approach and then macro averaging the results. We already obtained quite high results for evaluation metrics for this model, so we can already be quite satisfied of our classification. But let's perform a step forward by training a random forest model. As we mentioned before, a random forest is an ensemble algorithm which works by combining multiple decision trees to produce an optimal model. So let's specify the model we want to build, which is a random forest for a classification problem, and let's also create a recipe to add a preprocessing step designed to normalize the numeric predictor features. And let's bundle the two, so the model specification and the recipe, into a workflow object. Now that we have our workflow object, we can train a model by using the fit function again and test it on the test subset. So let's have a first look of the prediction results for the first 10 rows. Again, we can see that the model is able to successfully predict lots of labels with a high confidence score, but how we can know that this model is better than the previous one? We can visualize again our confusion matrix and observe how the number of correct prediction in the diagonal line is slightly greater than before. Or uh, we can, for example, appreciate the improvement by calculating the evaluation matrix again and observing how these numbers are slightly above the previous results. We could go ahead and compute other evaluation matrix or try to tune further our models or, or experimenting with different classification models. But we leave, it, we leave this over to you. This is another challenge. And for the scope of this demo, we will stop here. The decision tree, because that is so the, the first step of, of our adventure would be to build uh, classical machine learning uh, takes uh, data in a tabular form and it builds interpretable models, the models that you can look at and you can understand how they take decisions. But what if we want to, uh, instead of tabular data, what if we want to use uh, raw data such as pictures? For example, if we want to uh, distinguish between different uh, kinds of pigments from photographs, or if we want to distinguish between a penguin or a polar bear, uh, how can we do that? Well, uh, that is exactly the essence of deep learning. Uh, deep learning relies on neural networks. Neural networks are, great, uh, are large collections of neurons which built under human brain. And uh, those networks are trained using uh, large data sets. And uh, after training, they can perform uh, different tasks. So what uh, neural networks can do, they can recognize patterns in the input data, in the raw input data, such as images, video, uh, or natural, natural language. Uh, unlike uh, classical machine learning algorithms, neural networks, they are not interpretable because once we train the neural network, uh, all the logic is somehow contained within the weights of individual neurons. 
So if you want to learn more about uh, classical machine learning, we have uh, machine learning for beginners curriculum, uh, which you can um, actually take. Uh, and if you want to learn more about neural networks, you should go to AI for beginners curriculum. And let us continue with our journey. Uh, since I have mentioned polar bears, that brings us to our next destination, which is Arctica. So we move, moving from we are moving from Antarctica to Arctica across the globe, and uh, we will uh, see how the computer can recognize a picture of a polar bear. Well, let's uh, think how the computer can do that. When a human being uh, looks at a picture, uh, he looks across it and looks for some familiar patterns. For example, for a polar bear, we may look uh, at pose, we may look at uh, the ear uh, and different uh, those uh, familiar pieces. And we will scan the picture looking for those patterns. And that is exactly what a neural network, convolutional neural network does. It tries to look for those patterns. And uh, after those patterns are recognized, we use uh, a classifier, pretty much a machine learning model that you've seen before, on top of those features. That is a little bit simplified uh, view uh, of the picture because in real life, uh, the shape of the bear, the shape of pose, the shape of ears can be very different and you cannot recognize them uh, just you know, as one pattern. That's why uh, real neural networks, they have uh, hierarchical uh, pattern structures. So they first look for very primitive patterns like uh, strokes, horizontal strokes, vertical strokes. Then on the next level, uh, it sees how those strokes forms together a larger part of the picture until the whole object uh, becomes um, uh, visible to the neural network. Uh, so neural networks are actually hierarchical patterns extractors. And um, to see, uh, how uh, they actually work. Um, let's uh, do a short demo. So suppose I just came back from my trip to North and South Pole and I have a bunch of photographs which I want to classify into different uh, folders with bears, with penguins and with cats just because I happen to have, to have my cat with me as well. Let's see if we can do that easily with the help of AI. If you want to run this code after uh, this lecture, it's available at, the, at this GitHub repository, so you are definitely welcome to try it out yourself. We will use the framework called TensorFlow and its simplified API called Keras, which is one of the most popular frameworks nowadays. And if you want to learn more about it, we have the great TensorFlow learning path at Microsoft Learn, which you can use. So we'll start by loading this framework and then we will use the pre-trained network called VGG16 which can be easily loaded and Keras just with one line of code like this. Then we will take all our images and we will uh, load them from our directory, convert them into the size 224 by 224 into batches of five images. That's how those images will look like. You can see that uh, those images are mixed images of bears, cats and penguins. To run them through the network, we just need to call VGG predict. Well, before we need to call the preprocessing function and then decode predictions allow us to print it, this in human readable form. And you can see this is the first image, hammer bird with a probability of 0 0.38 or it's sea lion with a probability of 0 0.21 and so on. We have top five predictions here for the first image and also for all other images. So for example, for the cat, we have this Persian cat uh, or lynx or Egyptian cat and neural network cannot really really be sure which breed of cat it is because it can in fact distinguish between several different breeds of cats. You can also run the predictions through all our images and uh, see how they in fact easily classified can be easily classified into specific classes. Well, but how does that actually work? Let's try to uh, figure that out. We can print the structure of the VGG network by saying vgg.summary. And that's our typical pyramid architecture. It starts with the image 224 by 224 with three color channels. And then uh, as we extract features, the spatial dimensions are being reduced by the factor of two up to seven by seven. And the number of features is being increased each time up to 512 features. So at the end, we end up with uh, this representation of our image, which is converted into one uh, feature vector of the size uh, of around 25,000 elements. So uh, that's how the network works. Uh, to make sense what happens inside the network, we can try to uh, visualize uh, that. So we will take one of the images from our dataset, for example, this beautiful cat, 
and uh, I will try to see the activations from the first block after con the first convolution, so the after first application of filters, then from the middle of the network, and then final uh, convolutional block just before the classifier. So we can um, run this function to visualize that, and that's what that's what happens. This is the after applying filters, the first layer of filters. You can see that some filters they just do not pass any information through, but some of them highlight different parts of the image. So, for example, this one highlights uh, cat's eyes, and also it happens to highlight the background, and then uh, also like some of them highlights the fur more, and so on. The next level, uh, this is not the next, but uh, in the middle of the network, uh, it's much more difficult to make sense of what goes on. You can see that still the cat silhouette is visible, and there are uh, like quite a few filters which uh, actually filter out eyes, and again, there are some which filter out fur, and there are many more filters which just do not fire. Those white boxes means that uh, activation is very low. And finally, just before the classifier, uh, there are only some of the filters, uh, which indeed focus on the important parts of a cat. And those filters, this pattern of those filters, in fact shows that this is a cat and not a penguin. For the penguin, the pattern would be uh, different, and the final classifier picks that up. So what we can also do, we can try to uh, see how the ideal cat looks like. So here we start with a random noise image, and we want to target, for example, Siamese cat. We are saying, I want to display image which makes the neural network think that this is same as cat. And we minimize uh, the difference. So that's how it looks like in the beginning, very similar to random noise. And as this process goes on, we use gradient descent optimization, in fact, to find the image which would make the network uh, recognize a cat. You can see that this becomes uh, more and more similar, not exactly to a cat, but you can see some cat elements here. You can see some of the eyes, you can see some of the uh, shapes which resemble a cat, and they are assembled in quite a random fashion. But that's exactly what neural network looks for, for those patterns. And when it sees those patterns, uh, it, it, it gives us the result that it's a cat. So here you can see an ear of a cat and many, many eyes. So as we've seen, the top layers of the network, they extract features from the image. And we can, in fact, uh, try to convert all images to feature vectors. In this case, we load the network without the top classifier. And we can run uh, this network on all our images, uh, ending up with this uh, huge vector of uh, 85 is the number of images by 25,000 number of features. And those are different classes. Uh, so how can we actually make sure that close vectors correspond to, uh, to, to images uh, of the same class and images which are similar to each other? Well, to visualize that, we need to reduce the dimensions from 25,000 to something smaller, for example, to just two dimensions. For that, we can use a technique called principal component analysis from machine learning. And by reducing this to just the vector of two features, we can indeed see that uh, different classes of images correspond to different clusters of dots. And for example, uh, we can easily plot uh, the image corresponding to leftmost and rightmost dot here. You can see this is the ideal bear and this is the ideal cat. And it would be also interesting to see how those images look if we, for example, take the closer pixels and go from uh, left to right, for example, along the x-axis. So we can do that. We can sort everything along the x-axis and then display those images. And that's what we will get. Uh, I skip every fifth image. Um, to make it more uh, more understandable. But you can see that uh, images which correspond to pixels that are close to each other, they are visually similar. And that makes uh, feature vectors useful when we want to uh, look for similar images. That's how image search roughly looks like. Or if you want to group similar images together. If you want to learn more about computer vision in general, there is a great uh, computer vision learning path with TensorFlow on Microsoft Learn uh, or AI for Beginners curriculum, which we'll mention at the end. Now, in terms of running this code, you may be thinking that uh, I was running it on my own computer, which is a Windows machine, as you can see from this taskbar. But in fact, that is not the case. Let me open the terminal and you will see that it is in fact a Linux machine. It is uh, Ubuntu. It's a data science virtual machine, which I have created in the cloud, uh, which has the GPU. And that's why everything was so fast. Uh, I can easily connect to that machine and I can edit all the code in Visual Studio Code, which is probably the most convenient way to do it. 
but for some reason if you want to use data science virtual machine from the browser you can also do that you can uh, use jupyter hub environment and connect to that data science virtual machine uh, to the same notebook which will look uh, very similar to a visual studio code and you can execute the code in this way but probably visual studio code is the most convenient way for you to edit any code whether it's local or in the cloud or in any data center Good job so far. So we made half of the journey and I think we deserve a, a small break now. So we already covered quite a lot of content traveling from Antarctica to Arctica and transitioning from classical machine learning to deep learning. We would like to propose now um, a pair of yoga exercises that funny enough have the same names of the adorable creatures we've dealt with so far. Uh, so take a few seconds to read the instructions in this slide, get out of your chair and stretch a little bit. So for example, to do the bib pose, you can start on all fours with your hands and knees shoulder width apart, and from there, lift your hips up into the air so that your body forms an upside down shape. While so to get to you that I'm you not- You can like... come into a quadruped position, and then as you exhale, round your spine up towards the ceiling. No, no, I was just kidding, sorry for that. Uh, this is actually not a break, but a spoiler for the next demo. So can you believe that these instructions have not been written by a yoga teacher or a yoga lover? They have been written by a natural language processing model. And in particular, they have been written by OpenAI GPT-3 model that I would like to introduce to you. So this is the first generation of OpenAI's generative pre-trained transformer model. And during the training process, it was fed with almost all the content existing over the internet. It's one of the largest neural network ever trained with 175 billion learning parameters. The capabilities are very surprising. It is able to generate original poetry. It is able to write an article from scratch and even to code in a few coding languages. Also, a new Azure Cognitive Services called Azure OpenAI allows access to OpenAI's API to approved Microsoft customers in preview, combining the power of GPT-3 model to built-in enterprise-grade capabilities of Azure. But again, let's put into practice with a demo. So to prove to you that I'm not lying and that the yoga lessons instruction has not been written by a human yoga teacher, uh, in this demo, I will navigate to the OpenAI portal uh, in the playground environment provided for everyone who wants to test this model out. And I will show directly to you the answers of the model to my prompts. So for sake of simplicity in this demo, I'm not going to customize the NP model I'm going to use, and I'm going to leave the default model suggested by uh, OpenAI which is the DaVinci one, the most capable model of GPT-3 series. Uh, however, be aware that you can choose uh, over there a different model and you can also add domain specific training data to your model or you can even customize the result according to your needs. Uh, for example, you can specify a maximum length for your output, a stop sequence, or you can specify um, how many times a token can be repeated in the output and so on. So the default task mode set for this mode, um, uh, for this model, sorry, is complete. Uh, that means that the model will try to guess how to complete the text given a start text injected. In this context, designing your prompt is essentially how you program the model, uh, usually by providing some instructions or a few examples. This is different from most other NLP services, which we, we could be familiar with, uh, designed for a single task, such as sentiment classification or named entity recognition. Instead, the completion, the completion endpoint can be used for virtually any task, including content or code gener gener generation, summarization, conversation, or creative writing. So let's start by asking to GPT-3 model to provide us with the instructions to follow to perform the yoga exercise. So let's try to type the following prompt. Uh, you are a uh, yoga teacher and you are going to describe to your learners how to do the beer pose. Great, we have our prompt. So let's submit this prompt and let's see uh, the, the answer of the model. 
Great. As you can see, the, the model is describing us, so it's giving us an instruction on how to do uh, the, the beer pause. So I let you read um, uh, this instruction on your own, uh, but you can see that the result is slightly different from the instructions in the slide deck, since the model generates every time different text. Uh, but the content, of course, is very similar. Uh, the description is well structured and it looks very natural, as it was written by a human yoga teacher. And if we try to resubmit the same prompt asking the model to regenerate a new result, again, uh, a slightly different text will be pulled out uh, with a similar content, with similar instructions. Now, let's try to do a different kind of task. So let's use the last result as our prompt to ask the complete API to translate this text for us in Italian. <clears throat> so to do that, let's add here the instruction um, to ask for a translation. So translate <clears throat> the following text in Italian. Great. And let's submit this. Amazing, right? So it is translating uh, this small paragraph in Italian. And I'm sorry that only Italian speakers will be able to appreciate the quality of this translation. Um, but uh, I'm Italian. I can assure to you that this translation is very accurate and well written. And of course, I encourage you to perform similar tests with the language you are good at or to perform different tests, for example, changing the task, changing the engine or changing the, the type of result you, you want to uh, you want the model to um, pull out. And with this demo, not only we learned about GPT-3 NLP model, we also added a new stop in our map. We just landed to India, native country of the art of yoga. Well, we've also seen uh, neural networks that can handle text. So we've seen neural networks that can work with images. We've seen what the ones that can work with text. But as human beings, we are able to work with both of those modalities. And in fact, there are neural networks which are also multimodal, which can combine natural language and text. Uh, one of the examples of such a network is uh, Clip. Uh, Clip is a neural network that is able to compare an image and the textual description of that image. Uh, CLIP uh, stands for contrastive uh, pre-training. So uh, it is trained on the big uh, data set of images with corresponding captions. And uh, what it does, the way it works, is it converts the image to a feature vector in the similar way that we've seen in our demo before. And it also converts text to a feature vector. And then it compares those feature vectors. It tries to uh, train this comparison matrix in such a way that uh, images corresponding to the captions, um, uh, they uh, result in the vectors which are close together. So uh, that allows us then to compare uh, how well image, images correspond to a text. And there could be several uh, different usages for this capability, uh, which we will explore in the demo. Now it's time to do some experimentation. We will start by installing the OpenAI Clip library from GitHub repository. And then uh, we can load the model with one easy uh, step, with one line of code. And you can see that we get both the model and the preprocessing function, which we can use to uh, preprocess images that we want to pass to the network. So how can we use Clip? One of the usages is so-called zero-shot image classification, where we can use this pre-trained network to classify images by matching them to different text prompts. For example, I will take one of the images from my dataset, this one, and I will try to match it to a prompt, a penguin, a bear, and a cat. So I'm passing three prompts to my network and one image, and as a result, I get a vector of probabilities. So you can see that this is a penguin with probability 0.001, a bear with probability 0.002, and a cat with a probability of 0.998 which means that an image probably is a cat. And you can use that with uh, many different images and the queries can be much more complicated because the network has seen a lot of uh, data. But this is not very exciting. We have seen that a uh, simple VGG network can do image classification pretty well. What you can also do, uh, you can do the opposite. You can start with um, 
one textual prompt and the number of images. So in this example, I will take all images from my dataset, all cat images from my dataset, and then try to match them to a prompt called SCMS cat. And I will get the image which most closely corresponds to this query. So this is a SIAMIS cat from my dataset. What I can also do, I can, for example, uh, change this prompt to a cat with big eyes. And this will give me a cat with big eyes. That is quite exciting because we can do a uh, quite intelligent image search. Uh, however, we can also do uh, with Wikigen uh, and Clip, we can do image generation. Up to now, we have seen the networks which can uh, take images as an input and produce some kind of numeric output. But in this example, we will actually ask neural network to generate something new. So the way it works is uh, we use so-called generator. In this case, it's VQGAN, uh, which takes random vector as an input and produces an image as an output, an image which depends on this input vector. And then we ask clip, does this image correspond to our prompt or not? So for example, if we want to draw a boy with a penguin, we take the image and calculate the probability how well this image corresponds to the prompt. And then we can use this to adjust the input vector using gradient descent. And then we can again generate something more close to the prompt and repeating that many times, we end up with the image which corresponds to our text prompt. So I will not show you the code in detail because that is not very simple. Uh, I will use the library called Pixray, which is available on GitHub and you can easily install it like here. Uh, and then to use the library, we pretty much specify the text prompt and some settings like what image quality we want, uh, some custom losses. Do we want to pay more attention, for example, to saturation or to smoothness or to something else? And uh, which clips model do we want to use? So if we run this, and suppose I want to uh, generate an image of a cat that looks like a penguin. So uh, if you run this, you see that it loads uh, all the models. And it starts uh, with this uh, image, which is kind of uh, random noise. But if we wait a little bit, we will end up with something like this. And this is, I think, already quite impressive because you can see that this is really a creature, which is very innovative it indeed it looks like a little bit like a penguin and a little bit like a cat now in terms of where i run this code you can see that it is asia machine learning studio so in fact this was running in the browser but if you want to edit it in visual studio code you just click the button here and you open the visual studio code with exactly the same notebook and you can uh, do everything from vs code Well, I don't know about you, but personally, I find this very exciting. Uh, and uh, I will show you some more pictures uh, here on the slide uh, produced in the similar manner. For example, a picture of a girl with a robotic kitten uh, and the portrait. And this makes, us, makes me wonder uh, how a computer can produce something like that, because a neural network is just uh, a multiplication of uh, large matrices. So what it does, it multiplies some numbers and then it comes up uh, with those creations. That is uh, really fascinating. It makes us wonder if the computers can actually do something creative, what is creativity and so on. Those are all interesting questions which you can uh, think about in relation to artificial intelligence. And this demonstration brings us to our final destination, which is uh, uh, France, uh, which is the European capital uh, of art. Great demo, Dimitri, very impressive. And we are close to the end of this journey now. And we hope you clearly see that AI is based on a number of formal mathematical methods that allow us to extract patterns from data and train models to replicate the human behavior in some areas and solve new problems. However, since we talked about very complex type of tasks and application for AI, like generating original text or images, uh, this could sound very similar to a few science fiction movies where AI is represented as, as having some sort of emotions or able to take decisions unforeseen by its developers. It's worth mentioning that AI is a powerful tool, and as every powerful tool, it can be used for good or for bad purposes. Uh, what's important, it can be misused. So that's why we would like to wrap up with a quote from Satya Nadella, man versus machine, but about man with machine. 
And this quote wants to explain why Microsoft stated important principles of responsible AI to avoid accidental misuse of AI, including firmness in the choice of training data, reliability and safety, that means taking into account probabilities of predictions when taking decisions, or privacy and transparency. Um, that's right. Uh, thank you, Carlotta. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed our demos and uh, our quick introduction into AI. And this was just the beginning of a long journey. So if you want to continue this journey, I encourage you to visit some of the Microsoft Learn modules listed on the slide. In particular, you can learn more about uh, R and classical machine learning in the uh, module on machine learning with R, or you can learn more about uh, how neural networks can actually work with images uh, in TensorFlow and Keras uh, uh, module. And uh, definitely check out the responsible AI module. Uh, but the main the main stop where I encourage you to go is, of course, AI for Beginners curricula, which we released today. Uh, please, after the session, go there, check it out, put stars to us because we want to know that this curricula is useful. Uh, if you like it, uh, get in touch. Uh, and uh, in the curricula, you will find some links where you can ask more questions on AI, uh, which will make your learning uh, more effective. Um, and uh, I think that is the main uh, takeaway from the session. Continue this journey. The journey uh, to learn AI is really fascinating, and uh, I wish you good luck with learning AI. Awesome, Dimitri and Carlota, thank you so much. I'm definitely going to be checking out that AI for Beginners curriculum. It looks like it's packed with a lot of useful resources. We have time for about maybe one or two questions. Uh, so the chat, Carlota, I'll, I think I can ask you this one, but the chat is wondering what criteria should I use to evaluate what machine learning technique to use? Sure, so th this is a great question. Um, so I would say that, um, um, that the first thing is to um, explore the data. I mean, the, the first, the primary uh, task of a data scientist is um, um, working with data. So first thing first, you should explore your data, um, visualize your data, understand your data, and uh, you can, for example, already um, understand if you uh, if it's more a classification kind of problem or a regression kind of problem, um, depending if you are going to predict a category, so you, you will choose classification, or a quantifiable va value, so you would choose regression. Um, and more, you will, you will uh, for example, understand if you will need uh, to predict more than one category, so you will need a multi-class classification problem uh, or a binary classification. Uh, algorithm and and so on, or you have more complex type of um, of task um, um, similarly to what we just said in our demo. So you will need, for example, to choose a neural network. So I would definitely start with analyze my data. Wow, thank you so much for that and, and that response. Yeah, just to add to that, there is also a great uh, machine learning cheat sheet uh, available somewhere on the internet. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's useful when you want to decide which specific algorithm to use because sometimes uh, decision trees are better, sometimes uh, uh, like linear regression and uh, more about that you can learn in machine learning curriculum. Awesome. And just to finish off, we have one question and is the ideal cat idea the same way you would have that this person does not exist to create images of humans? Oh, thanks. That's really, really cool question. Uh, not quite, because as you've seen, we did not produce a nice picture of a cat in that demo. It was kind of similar to a cat, but very far from cat. Because uh, convolutional neural networks as such, they do not uh, keep precise location of the patterns. So, you know, if the patterns are somewhere like close to a cat, that's already okay. So it, they cannot be used uh, directly to produce nice images, but there are different, uh, the special neural network architecture called generative adversarial networks, which are specifically designed to mimic uh, images produced by humans. So the 
I don't know if I probably don't have time to this to, to actually explain the way they work. But again, in AI for Beginners curricula, you will find uh, a special section on uh, guns and the demo that you can run to produce uh, uh, flowers to train the network to produce nice uh, paintings of flowers, and that is very close to like the per this person doesn't exist. Awesome. I think that was actually a great overview. Uh, Carlota and Dimitri, thank you so much. Your session was so packed, so many resources there. And for everyone in the audience, that is the end for this session, but we still have so much more here at Intro to Tech Skills, so make sure to stay tuned. We'll be right back with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, have the great conference, everyone. Thank you.